Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the Asthma and Allergy Foundations of America's webinar, Managing Allergic Asthma in Children. We have a wonderful program for you today. Before we dive in, I would like to tell you a little bit about AFA and who we are. The Asthma and Allergy Foundation aims to be a trusted ally of the asthma and allergy communities. We are dedicated to saving lives and reducing the burden of these diseases through support, advocacy, education, and research. Without you, our community, we wouldn't be here. So thank you for joining us today. And thank you for everything that you do for those everywhere with asthma and allergies. My name is Stacy, and I am the public health manager here at AFA, and I'm happy to be your host for the program. Your speaker, who you will meet in just a brief moment, is Dr. John James. Finally, we do have a staff member ensuring everything on the back end runs smoothly. Her name is Zulima, and she is our support center manager. Now, let's go over some house rules. First off, everyone's video and audio are on mute, but if you have questions, please type them into the chat box on your screen. All questions will be received through our chat and will be answered at the end of the presentation. So please, we want you to ask as many as you would like. There will also be resources posted in the chat throughout the program as well, and many opportunities to participate in conversation through today's program by answering polling questions. So let's talk about what we will be discussing today. Today we will be discussing managing allergic asthma in children. We will find out what pediatric allergic asthma is, how many people are affected and the signs and the symptoms. We will also discuss environmental control and triggers that may contribute to an asthma or allergy flare, medication and treatment options that you may choose to take. At the end of this presentation, we will take some time to answer many questions that you may have. Let's talk about who will be presenting today. Our speaker is Dr. John M. James, MD. Dr. James is a board certified allergist. He is also president of Food Allergy Consulting and Education Services, LLC. He has worked as a medical specialist in the field of allergy, asthma, and immunology for over 30 years. Dr. James received his bachelor's degree from the University of Arkansas and his doctor of medicine degree from the University of Tennessee. He is a board certified by the American Board of Allergy and Immunology and Dr. James is no stranger to AFA and the AFA community. He has led many, many webinars and many other educational initiatives with us and many on his own. So please welcome Dr. John James. Dr. James, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Stacy, for your introduction. And I wanna especially thank the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America for inviting me to be the speaker and moderator of this webinar. Um, and I also want to thank all the attendees who have signed up and are here taking time out of your busy day to um, hear this presentation. It's a good time to be doing this presentation because we're in the midst of a very strong spring allergy season. So what is asthma? Asthma is a chronic lung disease that causes your airways to become swollen, making it hard to breathe. Asthma is the most common chronic disease in children. More than 25 million people in the United States have asthma. That includes 20.7 million adults and 4.8 million children. I'm gonna expound on some uh, facts from the Centers for Disease Control here. There are about 5 million office visits for asthma per year in the United States. 1.2 million emergency room visits for asthma per year in the United States, 170,000 hospitalizations per year, and about 3,500 or to 4,000 deaths per year in the United States from asthma, about 10 people a day. So asthma can be, be a disease that has fatalities, but your asthma can be controlled if and you can lead a normal, healthy, active life if you follow several uh, things, education on asthma, uh, avoiding and eliminating triggers for asthma, 
developing a treatment plan with your healthcare provider and follow-up visits with your healthcare provider. So there's no cure for asthma, but it can certainly be managed very effectively. Next slide. So the three main changes that occur in the airways with asthma include number one, swelling inside the airway, number two, excess mucus clogging the airway plus the swelling or inflammation, and three, tightening and squeezing of the small muscles or around the airway that cause that airway tube to constrict. So in the left figure, that's a normal airway with a wide open airway, normal mucosa, and at the end of that breathing tube are the alveoli where the gas exchange occurs, oxygen or carbon dioxide. So that's a, that's a healthy airway. In the asthmatic airway in the middle, the mucosal lining becomes enlarged and inflamed with mucus um, and the breathing is more difficult and those, uh, but you can still breathe in and out unless the asthma becomes more involved, like an asthma attack and that's on the right side. So there's more swelling of the airway, more inflammation and mucus, and then those smooth muscles around the airway become tightened, constricting the airway. So it's more difficult to get air in and out of the lungs and air is trapped in those alveoli. Also, increased airway hyperreactivity and hyperresponsiveness are the hallmark features of asthma. So pediatric allergic asthma, our focus today. Next slide. We have our first polling question now. Pediatric allergic asthma, and what you can do is select the, the, mo the answer you think is the most appropriate. We'll give you a little time before we go over an answer. So we'll see, uh, we'll be getting the results here. We can talk about those with you. So good, the, the third choice is the, the most uh, correct answer. Allergens that trigger your asthma symptoms, that's what pediatric allergic asthma would be. And a few, there were a few other choices. Certainly watery eyes is an allergy uh, symptom. Childhood asthma is not outgrown. Uh, we'll talk about that later. And asthma does not only happen in the spring, but it can be exacerbated during the spring. And asthma just will not, it might get better in the summer if you don't have allergies during that time of year, but typically lasts throughout the allergy seasons. Next slide. So what is pediatric allergic asthma? Allergic asthma, meaning that allergens trigger your asthma symptoms. Common allergy triggers include dust mites, animal dander, and this can be from cats, dogs, rodents, and other, pollen, this is pollen from trees, grasses, and weeds, and mold spores. Other triggers that can worsen asthma, you are familiar with this very likely, is physical activity, sporting events, uh, physical education class, and other activities. Air pollutants, passive tobacco smoke, and ozone in the environment or in the air, these can trigger asthma symptoms. And finally, illnesses, especially viral upper respiratory infections like a common cold, like um, the influenza, and even COVID. We've talked about this at a previous webinar. Next slide. So this uh, kind of gives an overview of the allergy triggers, and we're going to talk about these in, in uh, subsequent slides. So dust mites, animal dander, pollen, and mold spores. Next slide. So dust mites, they're too small to see with the naked eye. The body parts of dust mites and the feces are what contain the allergen and trigger allergy symptoms. Dust mites live in warm, moist areas. The ideal conditions are temperatures of great, uh, greater than 68 degrees Fahrenheit and humidity levels greater than 70%. Allergic sensitization can occur in children as early as under three years of age. Next slide.
So next we have animal dander. Animal dander, animal allergens are everywhere. They can be in the home, in the school, at, at social places. The protein allergens in pet dander, skin, saliva, and urine can aggravate allergic asthma, meaning that those allergens are present in all these areas. Pet hair or fur can also collect pollen, like tree pollen or grass pollen, and mold spores and bring those into the home and can impact allergic rhinitis and or asthma. Dog and cat allergens can even be detected at homes without pets. So if a child is at school and other kids have pets, some of those allergens can get on clothing and other objects, and then they bring those home and those allergens can be there even if there's not a pet cat or dog in the home. So they're very sticky and they can be moved around on objects. Next slide. So pollen allergy, it, this can, the age of onset is between two and five years and it peaks in the teenage years and young adult years. The common pollen seasons are in the springtime, we have the tree pollen. So right now, grass pollen season is in the very late spring and into the summer months. And the weed pollen season starts in the late summer into the fall. So all of these things, um, this is, these are the classic allergy seasons that we see in the United States. And also, you should know that climate change has definitely impacted pollen allergy. These seasons are longer and the, the pollen is more robust and active. So this has been a, an area of research that has, that has really been active over the past many years. Next slide. Mold allergy, mold can grow on almost anything where moisture is present, so damp and humid, and wet conditions. Mold produces tiny spores that, to reproduce, and these get into the air and get into the airway and cause allergy symptoms. Allergic sensitization to mold is like dust mites. It can occur in children even under three years of age. And mold spores are what trigger the asthma and allergic response. Next slide. So how common is allergic asthma? Up to 90% of children with asthma have allergic asthma. This is very significant. In adults, it's about 50% of adults with asthma have allergic asthma. Pediatric allergic asthma is more common in male children than female children early on in, in early childhood. As patients or individuals get older in the teenage and adult years, this flips and females uh, have more allergic asthma than males. Next slide. So some facts about pediatric allergic asthma, we, we know there's the link between allergies and asthma as we talked about in pediatric allergic asthma, but what we don't know a single direct cause, but there's many factors here that could be playing a role. A family history of asthma. So if one, one or more of the parents have asthma, this can be a contributing factor. If that individual has other allergies like hay fever or eczema or food allergies or siblings with these problems, that can play a role. Urbanization and pollution, like diesel exhaust, this can be a contributing factor to allergic asthma. Events in early life, including adverse childhood events, such as abuse, neglect, and domestic violence, these can even be a contributing factor. Exposure to environmental allergens and irritants, and being overweight or obese, these are known contributing factors to uh, asthma as well. Next slide. So signs and symptoms of, similar to what we would talk about for any type of asthma is, is included with allergic asthma. So shortness of breath, cough, chest tightness or pain, and wheezing. These are the most common four symptoms. But there can also be waking in at night, especially with cough disrupting sleep, a drop in peak flow rates if those are being recorded. These are common signs and symptoms. Next slide. So our second polling question, an example of an allergen is, and you can select the most common uh, choice there. We'll give you a little bit of time and then we'll go to the results.
Okay, let's see what uh, kind of choices we have here. Great. All of the above is definitely the answer because we just covered dust mites, mold spores, pollen, and pet dander. Each one of these can be an allergen that impacts allergic asthma. It might just be one, like a dust mite, or it could be all of these. So that's a I'm glad that answer was selected. Next, next slide. So the burden of allergic asthma is our next uh, section here, and we'll, we'll go to the next slide. So the allergy and, and the, the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America for many years now has been publishing a report on the allergy capitals and asthma capitals. This has been a very helpful report, and this just came out recently. You may have seen this on social media or at the APA website. Health outcomes are influenced by where you live. And APA's Allergy Capitals and Asthma Capitals report looks at factors that may make some places more challenging to live and, and to manage asthma and allergies. This year, the, for allergy capitals, the top three cities were Wichita, Kansas, Dallas, Texas, and Scranton, Pennsylvania, just to give you those examples. Next slide. So health disparities is another burden. And the definition for health disparities are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. Common examples of health disparities in the United States include asthma, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and heart disease. Next slide. Key information about disparities is they exist based on factors listed here, race, ethnicity, age, sex, sexual orientation, gender and gender expression, geography, disability, and citizen status. Health disparities include the following items, mortality, life expectancy, burden of disease, mental health, uninsured or un under uninsured, and lack of access to care. Next slide. So one feature we wanted to point out was that Black, Hispanic, and Indigenous individuals in the United States face the highest burden of asthma disparity. And these are caused by complex factors, including systemic and structural racism. Uh, compared to white Americans, Black Americans are nearly one and a half times more likely to have asthma. Puerto Rican Americans are nearly two times more likely to have asthma. Black Americans, five times more likely to visit the emergency department due to asthma. And this can be related to um, income levels, lower socioeconomic status, um, uh, type of living, where they live, and no primary care provider. So they, they use the emergency room as kind of like their primary care, which we don't like to uh, see happen. Black Americans are three times more likely to die from asthma. And finally, when sex is factored in, Black women have the highest rates of death due to asthma. So disparities are very important. They're a topic that we see more and more written about and in the media. So pay attention to this. Next slide. Now we'll move on to a section on allergic asthma treatments. So the three main areas we'll talk about. First, environmental control. Then we'll talk about asthma and allergy medications, and then we'll discuss a little bit on immunotherapy. First, environmental control is very important. Good indoor air quality is an important part of having a healthy living space and it can impact uh, diseases such as allergies and asthma. Next slide. So just some general features that we look at with environmental control. We start with the bedroom. We try to, during the allergy seasons, keep the bedrooms closed during the peak pollen seasons. Use air purifiers, especially HEPA filters, which are high efficiency particulate air filters. Many of you are familiar with these. Don't allow pets in the bedroom if a, if a child or an individual is allergic to a cat or dog. Remove scented candles and pay attention to other irritants in the room that could impact the asthma. Second would be air ventilation improving airflow in the home and in the bedroom, maintaining 
the HVAC system, which is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. Measuring humidity levels, we spoke about this earlier because uh, dust mites and molds love to be in high humidity, moist, damp areas. Identify and remediate leaks in areas that are ideal for mold growth. So in the basement or a bathroom where you might have mold growth, pay attention to that and remediate those areas. Finally, cleaning, doing regular cleaning, avoiding harmful, harmful cleaning products, establishing regular cleaning routines and vacuuming regularly with a high quality vacuum. Next slide. AFA has a really great Healthy Homes checklist. So check this out on the website. And they go through multiple areas of the home to find out what sort of tips and suggestions can be done to improve the indoor air quality. Bedroom, kitchen, living room, bedroom, et cetera. And there's also uh, available certified products that can be obtained to help in this uh, healthy home uh, process. So visit the website and pay attention to these factors. So let's move into asthma and allergy medications. Allergy medicines may provide temporary allergy relief for symptoms such as runny, itchy nose, itchy throat, sneezing, and itchy watery eyes. Also, allergy immunotherapy or allergy shots can be very helpful and useful in those allergy patients and asthma patients who are not controlled with typical uh, allergy medications. Some patients with severe allergies and asthma may be discouraged from owning pets. However, most people and individuals can effectively manage their symptoms with pets in the home. Next slide. So specific medications uh, for allergies, you're, you're familiar with antihistamines. We focus on the, what are called the non-sedating or second generation antihistamines. Examples would be Zyrtec, Claritin, Allegra. These are, are medications that are work for the allergy symptoms and hopefully will not cause drowsiness or concentration problems. Topical nasal steroids, I would tell you these are the most effective therapies for managing allergy symptoms in the nose, upper respiratory tract. There are also uh, oral medications, leukotriene modifying agents, which are anti-inflammatory allergy medications. They also help some patients with allergic asthma. And I want to focus on nasal saline irrigations, not necessarily a medication, but nasal saline can be prepared or they're pre-made products with uh, squeeze bottles or mist sprays that can be used in the nose um, once or twice a day or more often to rinse out irritants, allergens, and promote the health of the upper respiratory tract. And then allergen immunotherapy comes really in two main forms, subcutaneous or SCIT, which is the classic uh, shot therapy, and then sublingual or SLIT, which is drops or tablets under the tongue um, type of therapy. Next slide. So uh, allergen immunotherapy, many of you are familiar with this. Um, it's a preventative treatment for allergic reactions to substances such as pollen, animal dander, dust mites, and bee venom. It involves gradually increasing doses of allergens to which the person's allergic. One patient might just be allergic to pollen, but another patient might have allergies to pollen, animal dander, and dust mites. So it depends on their history, their diagnostic workup, and the allergist formulation of treatment sets. Over time, this therapy causes the immune system to become less sensitive or develop tolerance when exposed to relevant allergens. So when the allergy season rolls around, if that person has successfully been treated with allergy shots, they'll have fewer symptoms and less problems overall. Ultimately, this treatment reduces clinical symptoms of allergies and in turn can reduce allergic asthma symptoms. The process can take up to three to five years and injections uh, should be given in an allergist's office. There's a waiting time. Uh, they should not, those should not be given at home. And then sublingual immunotherapy after initial time, there, there can be patients who are receiving these at home under proper guidance from their allergist. Next slide. So following um, 
asthma medications and treatments will go into, I'm gonna to speak to the asthma action plan in subsequent slides, but first of all, I wanna talk about or give you an overview of the types of allergy medications. First, quick relief medications, which work quickly to relieve sudden symptoms. The patient takes them as needed and at the first sign of symptoms. Then there are controller medications, which help overall control of asthma by correcting the underlying inflammation and changes in the airways uh, over time and preventing uh, asthma attacks and problems. And then there are combination therapies, which include the, an inhaled corticosteroid plus a long-acting bronchodilator. Um, these have become more popular over the past few years, uh, combination therapies. And then there's biologic. Some of you might be familiar with these or might have, have individuals you know that are on these biologic therapies. These treatments target a specific cell in the body or protein to prevent swelling and inflammation in the airways. And these are for people with certain types of persistent asthma and they're given by injection or infusion. So it has to be an extensive workup. The patient has to have a certain type of asthma that's moderate to persistent. And then they have to get approval because these medications can be expensive and they have to be followed very closely with their specialist. So the asthma action plan, this is a written plan that is very important uh, for managing not only allergic asthma, but all types of asthma. So it'll cover short acting reliever medications like albuterol, long acting controller medications like inhaled corticosteroids, combination therapies and leukotriene modifiers and biologic therapies. There are common myths about asthma. Number one, asthma only affects children and is typically outgrown. Well, that is not true because asthma can, infect, can affect children and adults. And if, if a child has asthma and is very involved in their, until they're maybe their early adulthood and they get better, they might have many years doing well, but then have a bad illness or bad allergy season and the asthma symptoms come back. I had several siblings in my family that were like this. They thought they were smooth sailing for a while, but then they, their asthma symptoms return. So it's not something that is, is typically outgrown. If you're not wheezing, it is not asthma. Well, that's false because you can have coughing, you can have chest tightness, you can have disruption of sleep and exercise activities are not going well. It, uh, wheezing does not always have to be present. Asthma is not a serious disease. Well, that's definitely not true. Asthma can be, if it's not controlled, it can be a serious disease, can lead to emergency room visits, hospitalizations, even fatalities we've talked about at the beginning of the presentation. Asthma medications are habit-forming, dangerous, and lose effectiveness over time. This is not true. Asthma medications are, many people ask about albuterol or inhaled steroids. These are not habit-forming. If they're used appropriately, they're safe, there's minimal side effects, they are not dangerous, and they are effective over time. Individuals with asthma should not exercise or play sports. Well, this is so untrue. We want our patients to be active in all their sporting activities, their daily activities. We want them to sleep the night. Well-controlled asthma should allow for all these things to occur at the highest level. Next slide. So a polling question. The asthma-friendly home checklist we spoke to earlier please um, select uh, your choices here. And uh, we'll give you a, a little bit of time to do that. Okay, let's see what results we have here. So great both A and D. So A is will the asthma friendly home checklist will help you control asthma triggers in your home and will help your home asthma and allergy, will make your home asthma and allergy friendly. Those are both together should be the answer. So great. And remember the, the home checklist and the certified products I mentioned at the Apple website. Next slide. This part of the presentation, I re we really wanted to put in to give, give some, some relevance to what we're talking about. One of my patients in clinic, um, his story. So we'll go to the next slide. 
So Joe is a 10 year old male with a history of mild persistent asthma. He presents into the clinic with a one month history of his symptoms worsening, increased coughing at night and with activities like soccer shortness of breath and intermittent wheezing. So all of these symptoms have been noticed by the patient and his parents. History of asthma worsening in the late spring and in summer and during the fall when school starts. So this has been a history that the family has noticed. There is a strong family history of asthma, allergic rhinitis and eczema. And Joe's medications at presentation in the clinic were Simbacort, this is a, an inhaler, uh, two puffs twice daily. This is the typical childhood dose, 80 over 4.5. And the 80 uh, refers to the inhaled steroid and the 4.5 to the long-acting bronchodilator. And albuterol, the quick reliever, as needed every four to six hours. This use has increased in his history. Next slide. So, uh, the healthcare provider uh, takes the history and then does a physical examination in the clinic. The vital signs are all pretty much uh, normal. The, it mainly focus on the respiratory rate. This is a normal respiratory rate in the 10 year old. Uh, pulse oximetry is at the lower end. It's still normal on room air, but it's, it's, it's at that break point um, being normal. Uh, mild, runny, stuffy nose exa on examination, itchy red eyes, there's intermittent wheezing on auscultation on the physical exam, no chest retractions, but, but Joe does seem to be fatigued, not only from what the parents noticed, but he just doesn't seem to have normal energy based on previous examinations that when he's been in clinic. Next slide. So um, then we go on to some objective measures and I cannot stress enough about spirometry. And this is mainly done in specialist offices, but some uh, primary care health providers use spirometry in their office. This is an objective lung function measurement, very helpful. So the FVC is the forced vital capacity, sort of like the total lung capacity. This measurement here is normal. The in parentheses are the normal ranges or normal values. FED1 is the forced expiratory volume in the first second. And this is, is decreased 1.7 liters, and you can see the normal value. And most importantly is the FEV1 over FEC ratio, which is very indicative of obstruction. And you can see here is definitely low, 63 compared to 89, which is the normal value. Peak flow rates have been low reported by the family and Joe. So 3.24 liters per second, and it should be five liters per second. So definitely decreased. And a post bronchodilator FEV1 measurement is very helpful. So you can see here, he above 15% is considered very norm, very good, and he has a 20% improvement, so he has good reversibility, which is what we want to see in an asthmatic who's going to respond very well to treatment. Allergy testing performed in an allergy specialist office, so a positive to common trees, juniper and elm, grass, Bermuda, and weeds, ragweed. So these were done in the allergist office. Next slide. So recommendations for Joe would be increasing the Simbacort inhaler four puffs twice a day for the next month and then reassess at a follow-up visit. This adjustment could be done in that yellow zone, definitely in the red zone we talked about earlier. So that's what I was talking about, adjustments and therapies. Continuing albuterol, two puffs, and this might be, this might be recommended on a schedule in the yellow zone, so every six hours, say, and then as needed and 15 minutes prior to exercise and exertion. Discussing environmental control measures related to the pollen season, like keeping the windows closed, um, changing clothes after coming in from outside. So those are specific uh, control measures. Nasal saline irrigations I mentioned on a daily basis and reviewing allergy medications, antihistamines, topical nasal steroids, and finally asthma medications, the topical corticosteroids, uh, as we mentioned, and and uh, is Simbacord. So those are things we want to go over with the family and Joe in the clinic and adjust the asthma action plan accordingly. Next slide. So to put it all together with Joe and his family and sort of the shared decision-making process, Joe's relationship with his provider is so important to his health and successful asthma control and allergy management. 
So Joe, his family, and the provider would have discussed specific environmental control measures to decrease allergy symptoms, whether that be with pollen, animal dander, dust mite, and mold. Adherence to the medical treatment plan for allergies and asthma when allergen immunotherapy might be an option. So these are typically patients who are not responding to classic and typical allergy and asthma medications. They're having more problems. So allergen immunotherapy would be an add-on therapy to get be more aggressive with their allergy control over time and hopefully develop, have the patient develop tolerance during their allergy seasons and allergy exposures. When should the, would Joe come back to clinic for office visits or acute care? So the communication with the provider, the individual, and the caregivers is important and will help asthma and allergies to be well controlled in this uh, situation. Next slide. So this sort of summarizes what we've been talking about. The healthcare provider is, uh, primary care provider is so important. And, and this could be a family physician, a pediatrician, an internal medicine doctor, a physician assistant, a nurse practitioner. Then when patients are having troubles with their allergies and asthma, they can be referred to an asthma and allergy specialist. And this is where the diagnostic testing can be so important, developing more aggressive treatment plans um, and trying to decide whether immunotherapy would be a, a viable option. And reviewing all the medication options, including in some patients, the use of uh, dual controller medications, the combination therapies, and allergen immunotherapy, and in some cases, biologic therapies. So how can um, allergy and asthma symptoms be reduced? Well, obviously avoiding the triggers that have been identified, environmental control measures, including things in the home that can be done with the healthy home checklist, medication management from quick relievers to controllers to immunotherapy to biologics, following the written asthma action plan, cannot stress that enough, checking in with your healthcare team when recommended and when needed for acute flare-ups and exacerbations. Next slide. So the last polling question, what are you going to do to re reduce your asthma symptoms? So please uh, make your choices here. So let's see what the responses are here. Wonderful. So this is what we've talked about in the presentation today. And all of the above is the correct choice. Following the healthy home checklist, reducing exposure to relevant triggers, staying in contact with the healthcare team, and following the written asthma action plan. Great. 100%. That's wonderful. Okay, next slide. I'll turn it back over to you, Stacey. Stacey, I think you're muted. You are correct, Dr. James. <laughs> Thank you so much for this incredible presentation. I know I personally have learned so much through your um, words of wisdom and your applicable uh, practice and what you've seen within clinic and what you've worked with um, throughout the longevity of your career. So thank you so much for that. And thank you to our audience for participating with us throughout the presentation. Your polling questions really made my day. It was wonderful to see everyone uh, participating and progressing as we learned together. So before we jump into our Q&A time, which I know is what everyone is waiting for, I'm going to let Dr. James catch his breath for a minute, and I'm going to share a few of these resources on the screen with you. So APA offers educational materials and tools for patients of all ages. Some are available in Spanish, and we invite you to browse our online store for free educational materials about asthma and allergies. I also want to highlight our support center. We have a support center, which Zulima, our support center manager, who you will see shortly, um, staffs, is, and it's available Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern time, except for U.S. holidays. So if you have a question, if you would like to call into the support center, 
please, by all means, do so. You can access, um, ask the allergist questions here. You can ask any questions that you might need. And that number is 1-800-727-8462. Another resource that we have and that we would love for you to enjoy is joining our online communities. So these are for asthma and allergy support or food support, and you can get connected with other members managing the same conditions of asthma, allergies, especially food allergies as well. Our online communities are available 24 seven and are moderated by experienced staff. We also have a learning catalog chocked full of online courses and resources about asthma, allergy, and food allergy for patients, families, healthcare providers, asthma educators, and caregivers. These courses are self-paced, so you can move at the speed that you want to and go through the lessons at your convenience. I mentioned Ask the Allergist before, and I just think this is such a wonderful free tool that we have out there. So you can search the Ask the Allergist knowledge base for answers to many questions that you may have had today and may have thought pre prior to this webinar today. Um, our board certified allergists will answer general questions about managing asthma, allergies, medications, and treatments. Ask the Allergist does not answer specific questions about specific consumer products, so remember that. And this information is definitely not a substitute for medical advice from your physician, but it's a wonderful additional resource and tool. And finally, we invite you to learn more about our Asthma and Allergy Friendly Certification Program. This program has products that have met our standards and earned the certification and can tell you where to buy these products. AFA joined with Allergy Standards Limited to create this certification program and it helps everyone to understand product claims and make informed decisions. We test household products against strict standards and if products pass our tests, they earn the Asthma and Allergy Friendly Certification mark. When you see this mark, you know that the product is proven to be better suited for those with asthma and allergies. Some examples of what you might be looking for may be air cleaners, filters, bedding, cleaning products, flooring and insulation, paint, and many, many more. There's a whole list of products. So please visit this website and learn more. So with that, it's now time for the Q&A portion. So I'm gonna turn my camera off and mute myself and hand this section over to Zalima and Dr. James. Thank you, Stacy. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. James, for a wonderful presentation. We're gonna move forward with our question and answer session. Um, so here is our first question. Will children ever grow out of certain allergies or asthma? We'll touch on this during the presentation and typically these conditions are not outgrown especially the asthma question comes up a lot to me in clinic um, so if a child has asthma they might get better during say their late teens early adulthood adulthood years but then suddenly there's a there's a major trigger like a covid illness or um, some other major stressor in, in life and the asthma symptoms return because that asthma never really goes away completely but with good control and sometimes over time symptoms are very minimal and people think they might have outgrown it with allergies with with out, some allergies like food allergies you might see a, a patient with has egg allergy or milk allergy and there there can be tolerance development or outgrowing of that but with many food allergies like peanut and tree nuts, they they're not typically outgrown with age. So it depends on the allergy, but in typical, I would say they're they're not outgrown. Um, just so that, that gives you a good perspective there. Our second question: At what age should a child with allergic asthma start immunotherapy, also known as allergy shots? So this is a great question, and it's not going to be the same with every allergist that you ask. But in general, they typically start around five to six years of age. So, and there has to be criteria met. So they've been on allergy medications, asthma medications. They are not controlled. They have exposures they cannot be get away from. 
they're having emergency room visits or morbidity. So they have to meet criteria to think about going. So you have the environmental control, medications, and then immunotherapy, sort of that third step of treatment. So they're, they meet criteria, and then typically it's around five to six years of age. That doesn't mean that there's not a three-year-old who wouldn't go on allergy shots, and some allergies, that some of that depends on the allergist and their uh, treatment style and practice. Our next question, do you have tips on how to help my kid use a nasal rinse and nasal spray? Yes, I, I, I think it, it is dependent on the individual and the age. And if there are some kids just do not want to do this. So you, it, you can make it up. There's some pre-made uh, forms of nasal saline or there are mist sprays. I, there's a soft mist spray sometimes that I'll use in my really young patients when they're afraid to use that bulb where they, you're spraying a more forceful amount of saline into the nose. So there's a mist spray that does a pretty good job of clearing out the irritants and allergens. And you want to make sure that you don't spray it on the mid part of the nose. You want to spray it outward toward where the turbinates are, the nasal membranes. So because with spraying it on the nasal septum, sometimes there can be nosebleeds. So the, the, the infant can be working with the parent and lean over the sink or over, over and spray up the nostrils. It can be done very gently and it can be done once a day or twice. Some people love it and they do it more than twice a day. So I think there are a few tips. I think the type of spray or mist is important and, and the direction of how they spray it. Those are things to pay attention to. Our next question, does post-nasal drip from allergies make asthma worse? Absolutely. So if, and if you've had allergies, if you're aware of this, I have allergies. So I know in post-nasal drip in my season, which is right now in the tree season, there's, there's post-nasal drip. You, you, you can't stop it all the time, but you can use irrigations and topical nasal steroids and antihistamines. But if that drip gets back down into the airway around the vocal cords or even can get into the airway, it can it is a very irritating and there's allergens in there too and it can get into the airway to cause that allergy response, inflammation, mucus buildup, constriction of the airway. So definitely post nasal drip, we try to control it as best as possible, not always totally 100 percent effective, but definitely can make allergies uh, and asthma symptoms worse, no question. Our next question, can a diet rich in antioxidants help decrease the inflammation found in asthma? This is a great question. Um, and I, I went back to this recently. I, was, I had this question posed to me and I, I went back just to look at the, the spectrum here. So diet, so let's talk about fruits and vegetables would be examples of, of foods that have are high in antioxidants. So the antioxidants are not that, you know, the sole treatment for, they're not really considered the sole treatment for asthma, like an inhaled corticosteroid, but they can be very helpful in combating those uh, oxidants that are produced by inflammatory responses. So they can be very helpful enhancing uh, asthma treatments and in and of themselves can be good for when you have inflammation in the airways. So thinking about the diet, diet is so important in asthma therapy and allergy therapy as it is in other medical conditions that we treat. Diet is becoming more, more and more important. There's more and more focus on diet. Many um, books and social media things do pay attention and get good advice from your healthcare provider sometimes and as, as well from a dietitian, nutritionist and get good information. That, that's probably the thing I would, I would stress um, here as well. Our next question, are eczema flare-ups related to seasonal allergies and asthma? Definitely. E eczema is sort of one of those allergic conditions that I didn't talk about today, but it's, it's an allergic condition involving the skin. And patients with eczema can see flare-ups during an, a relevant allergy season, like right now, the tree season. If they're really allergic to tree pollen, not only can they have symptoms in their upper respiratory tract like hay fever, but they can see flare-ups of, of their skin rashes. And this might also happen with exposure to animals or to dust mites. And that, and they might see it when they're having that allergic asthma flare-up. They're also seeing 
their eczema flare up because these conditions are, are allergy triggered. They have basis, basic allergic inflammation processes and they all can be uh, aggravated during a relevant allergy season. Our next question is, is there an asthma action plan for allergic asthma? So what I would say here is, is typically use that written asthma action plan that we showed today and add on the allergy treatment. So if there's some specific environmental control measures that need to be listed on there, if there are specific antihistamines, topical nasal steroids, a leukotriene modifier, if patients are on allergy shots, we'll incorporate those, have the healthcare provider incorporate those into the written asthma action plan. So if you have allergic asthma, both of those types of therapies are gonna be on the written plan. This is very important, especially for children who are at school or in daycare. So the, the, the workers at the school, the teachers, the health aides see everything for that child, not just an asthma therapy, but they see that there are certain medications that that child is on for their allergy control as well. Our next question is, aside from administering my child's controller medications as prescribed, what steps can I take as a caregiver to help prevent asthma attacks during weather changes and allergy season? Most of the stuff is gonna be common sense recommendations, getting appropriate rest, good diet, um, doing things before exercise that can help in, in allergy seasons, like we'll exercise mainly by warming up, doing appropriate warm up periods and then taking the albuterol. Uh, knowing, being aware of the allergy season. So we're in the tree pollen season now, if you can follow pollen counts in, in different times of the year. So like in the spring trees, the summer grasses in the fall, uh, the weed pollen, uh, paying attention to if, if there's weather changes. Sometimes you, you can't really prepare for this, uh, especially with the types of weather changes we've seen in our country in the last few years with, with just tornadoes and thunderstorms and flooding. So, but being aware that those things can trigger asthma symptoms and making sure you're on your controller medications and following the asthma action plan. Uh, stressful situations uh, can be, knowing that those can trigger, then being prepared for those things uh, can be a, another proactive measure to be ready. So if you're going to have a stressful situation, that your asthma will be controlled. <clears throat> okay, and this concludes our question and answer session. Yeah. Dr. James, I'm going to hand it off to you for some closing thoughts. So I think we did, the time worked out just perfectly. I wanted to um, thank the audience again for your attention and for participating in this uh, webinar on pediatric allergic asthma. Thank you so much for your questions. Remember, the Apple website is a very trusted and reliable resource. I know you're inundated with all these websites all the time, but this is a very trusted website for allergies and asthma, so please utilize it when needed. I want to thank the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America again for inviting me to be uh, the speaker and all the staff members who have helped me to prepare this webinar and who have worked with me over the past few years in, um, in my consulting work with APA. So uh, this concludes the session. Thank you again. Have a great rest of your day.